could you kind of talk a little bit maybe Steve about your role at the BBC now? I mean, yeah. like you're, you're head of productions. So I mean, what does that entail? Um, it's twofold really. As the name suggests, his primary responsibility is um, the programmes that the BBC make itself uh, across the genre from sort of drama to sport, factual, big digital side, learning department as, as well, uh, big events like BBC did a massive event at Titanic Quarter last uh, Saturday and around the proms. Um, so, you know, that's the big piece. Uh, and the, the broader piece, which is interesting and attractive as well, is about sort of being, helping the BBC to engage with a wider creative sector in Northern Ireland and kind of really help grow Northern Ireland as a creative economy. Uh, so I work with Indies there to try to help them yeah. uh, plug into Network BBC um, and work with Northern Ireland Screen, for example, to try to see how can we kind of together, you know, help grow the grow the creative business, basically. Right. So, like, I mean, obviously, before you took on the job, you you you'd done your due diligence as to how Northern Ireland was, how it was regarded as like as a as a base and what you could do in Ireland locations. What what do you, in your mind, are like Northern Ireland's strengths for bringing in productions, both the BBC productions and other productions as well? It's transformed, really, and uh, obviously since I since, since I left. But even in the past ten years, as a creative economy, and I think the work that Northern Ireland Screen have done there to bring in big, long-running um, productions and interesting, they focus very much on TV production as opposed to say feature films, which are singles essentially. Yeah. Um, so something like Game of Thrones um, has helped create a, a base of craft skills, it creates confidence. Uh, other people then look to invest, and I think the BBC, in its own way, you know, focusing on primarily serving the local audience, but also, which is a big part of my job, serving network audiences with programmes made mm -hmm. here. It does feel like there's a lot of kind of good things coming together in the, in the same direction. And, you know, it requires a bit of coordination and work. It's not, you know, sort of free money being given. You have to fight for each commission. Mm. But there, there's, there's a very good, I think, production and craft base there now. I think as a location, Northern Ireland stands out. It's, you know, it's got sort of mountains beside lakes, beside cities. You can do an awful lot in a day, which for big scale productions is important. Yeah. Uh, tax breaks are good. Yeah, it's, you, you said there, like, I mean, one of your jo primary jobs is to kind of like serve the network audience, you know? I mean, that would also kind of mean, I suppose, representation of Northern Ireland on screen, yeah. you know? I mean, what, 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 like, what are your, your, your plans and your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, I think it's a balance because I think, uh, look, fundamentally the job is about helping programme teams to make good programs, uh, I, I should say content, although I think that's quite a cold word, but Co content's a horrible word. But we do do a lot of digital yeah. activity, which you couldn't call a program, I think we need to find a better word. But so fundamentally, it's about making good stuff, basically, that people want, that's it, right? But in terms of jobs and opportunities, um, I've lost my train of thought. In terms of jobs and opportunities, Represent it, yeah. if you only made programs about Northern Ireland, I don't know how many programs you could ever make to meaningfully attract you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of jobs. So part of what we do is we make programs like Line of Duty, would be a, a BBC and I um, managed drama. You know, that's not about Northern Ireland, but it's made here, so it's jobs. The Fall would be an example of representation as well as jobs. Mm. And, and uh, I forget jobs, it's creatively exciting. It's, we, you know, BBC Northern Ireland is the two biggest dramas in BBC Two, he said, plugging. Um, but, but representation is absolutely key. I mean, I was actually thinking about this today in another context, but you know, the BBC was set up in the 20s with its motto, Nation Shall Speak Peace Unto Nation, which is clearly a product of the post-World War I, and I think the founders were, had all served in France. Um, I think there's a function of the BBC, well, the nation shall speak to nation. I think it's really important that, you know, English people get to see Northern Irish people, Scottish people, mm. Welsh people, and, 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 and different flavours of that. I think that's mm. part of what a national institution can do. So part of what we do, for example, we make programmes for the one show, um, and part of the push is to be, you know, we're not going to make 50 films a year about Northern Ireland, but we should be making a significant proportion so that people in Great Britain can see Northern Ireland outside the context of a man's body has been found in an entry. And again, go back to my own childhood, the BBC seemed impossibly far away because I didn't see anybody or hear anybody with my accent except in a news bulletin, mm. you know, which is why I never would have had the temerity to write to Jim or fix it. Possibly, um, <laughs> given what we know now, it was yeah, sort of, you know, I'm not saying it was a massive loss of my childhood, but it never would have occurred to me. The BBC seems so impossibly far away. Yeah. yeah. It, that, that, it's, it's interesting because when you mentioned earlier on about Blue Peter and kind of like Jimmy Savile, mm. you know, and, and, and that kind of distance as well. I mean, in terms of programs which kind of represent Northern Ireland, aside, aside from say the Fall and Call of Duty, you know, are there any other programs which have been ha you, you, which you kind of have seen a good uptake when it's been plugged into the network? Programs from here which have been kind of had, had a good uptake. Yeah, I think the best example of that was something which ironically I was involved in from an RTE point of view, which was a documentary on the disappeared, which was made last year, um, and that's a good example of creative 
relationships and a bit of financial pressure in a way that because RT had less money we had to do more co-productions so in a way we reached out had a good relationship with BBC Northern Ireland and we made uh, or the team made a documentary that um, had an enormous impact on, in Ireland on both sides of the border but also played on BBC Four and I think the conventional wisdom would be well it's about Northern Ireland it's about the troubles it had a big audience for BBC Four and, and a big yeah. impact there and, and I'm particularly proud of that in a, in a way because it's a story you sort of feel well sure we know that even for a local audience oh we know that you know mm. but actually just the way we applied documentary techniques to that it, 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 it really made a difference. But I often feel as well though Steve that sometimes you know you, 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 there, there are programs which, which are, are screened and they're about events that you think everyone knows about but you've got to remember as well that the younger audience come up who might not necessarily know that you know yeah. sometimes I kind of feel that I, I always kind of feel when programs appear about something like say they disappeared or it's, it's a series of, um, RT and, or it's a program on RT and BBC the last couple of nights about the Catholic Church and babies going to America yeah. and like, that's a story I knew about but there's a whole audience I realised who didn't yeah. know about that as well. I think, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's a recurrent thing. I mean, we can talk about troubles coverage separately, but I think when you're looking for ideas, um, we can often, in, in, in you know, my business, be too dismissive and say, oh, sure, everyone knows that, and sure, a programme was made on that, because we all want to do the first, yeah. you know, first yeah. person on the moon syndrome, you know? But you're absolutely right. There's a lot of, it's, it's how you tell the story. And I think some of the best documentaries, for example, shine a light on something, pardon me, shine a light on something you kind of think you knew, but you didn't. Um, when it's done well, it can be incredibly powerful, as can drama. I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive fan from a broadcaster programmer point of view of what drama can do. It can yeah. really get inside a story and it doesn't mean that necessarily needs to be based purely on sort of factual drama, although I think that's something we can do well in Northern Ireland. I think there's a strong popular journalism tradition. But drama can really get inside the heart of something in a way that sort of a, a, yeah. a purely factual documentary can. Yeah, you, you, you mentioned the dreaded word content there and you know, that's in obviously um, in, in the context of new platforms and the way like I mean, digital has changed everything, the way online has changed everything. Yeah. How does that affect like your job? You know, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the money is coming in for you to produce things like, um, to do things like The Fall or Lion's Duty mm. or whatever. You know, but then there's also kind of like that feeling, like it, it, it's, it's, I come from a print background, so in print yeah. background, the, the, it's not a case of the elephant in the room, the elephant has taken over the room. Yeah, like yeah. from a TV point of view, from the BBC point of view, How's that working out? Um, I, I think all broadcasters are finding, and, and, and all media organisations are finding their ways. I think, um, look, I mean, the whole, the, the whole digital platform which has emerged during my career is exciting. It's a way of getting things out there. Uh, it's a way of people engaging with uh, your shows. Different genres are different. I mean, radio is a beautifully interactive medium and always was. They've always had phone ins. So, digital media, social media works beautifully for radio because the format itself is open to people interacting. There's a question mark around a drama, which is essentially done and made before it goes out. What do you do around that? Um, but the point is, you can do things around it. And then sometimes it's not even about what you do around it with extra content. Mm. It's about a fans can build their own community around a show they love. Yeah. And I, part of my thing is to say, well, that, that's, that's good. It doesn't have to be us doing it. Yeah. Um, I think, though, um, what has proved surprisingly resilient is traditional linear TV and radio um, in, in all markets. In a way, possibly even five years, you wouldn't have predicted. Um, I saw some research uh, a year or two ago about even when everybody, or virtually universal penetration of what we call PVRs, which is like Sky Plus and Freevee Plus, and everyone's multi-channel. So in other words, when everyone's got loads of choice and everyone can time shift and do box sets, live viewing is still predicted to be sort of three quarters of all viewing mm. on a traditional linear schedule. And I think that's interesting. So TV and radio are surprisingly robust. Mm. And I, I, you know, I also believe you look at the way the internet is going, even something like YouTube is turning itself into channels and it's doing longer form. So not, it's not my line, but I think it's true that you know, I think the internet is becoming more like TV than TV is becoming more like the internet. Yeah. People, I mean, you could disaggregate all programs and just put them out there and you could sit down and watch whatever you want. But you know, that's quite tiring as well. Yeah. And I think yeah. another thing that's happened is that this is retrofitting modern new parlance, but a traditional TV channel schedule is like a curated feed. It's a group of people using experience, enthusiasm and judgment to say, you might like this drama, you might like this documentary, mm. here's the news. Mm. And we're gonna give you a blend that you may want to watch or not. Yeah. Uh, but other people are using their kind of judgment because we all have to sit all day at work making loads of choices. And I think, you know, common sense would say when people get home, they kind of want to have sort of, you know, well, this is an yeah. interesting 
Yeah, I, I also, I'm not going to search for it. Yeah. It's, it's interesting you kind of say that because yeah. I've always kind of felt that like traditional media organizations, be it the BBC or RT, or or basically like I mean even some like a, some like a, some old organization like the Irish Times, they have that advantage in that like I mean they managed to build their name and reputation during the good during the times of plenty and also the times when yeah. like I mean media and this were quite scarce. Well, when I look at the Irish Times, technically I could go and search every article itself and find all that information out myself. But I trust the Irish Times brand, and if people there, like yourself, are cur curating, here is our, here are some interesting articles, that's great. Yeah. Now, the fact I can get each individual article myself, I do as well. But I think there is still room for, this time's terribly marky, what are trusted brands? I want to say what are bra brands. One other thing is I have thought is the traditional public service mixed genre schedule where you have a documentary and a play and a some music programs and news, I think that's becoming a public service in itself, in that the way the commercial market is going, it's very niche, it's pushing you into kind of, if you like comedy, here's an entire channel with comedy stacks of, you know, have I got news for you? And if you're on Amazon, it tries to sell you things that you already like. Yeah. iTunes sells you back your record collection, basically, in my experience. Or that, just gives you your record collection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just gives you your record collection. Um, so that's the commercial thrust, is the kind of niche and super serving small audiences. There's no opportunity to stumble across social media. You sign up to people you like and they agree with you. So you don't hear anything else. Yeah. Whereas I can remember as a kid watching too much TV, you know, I would stumble across a play for today that I never would have watched. Um, and I think that mixed genre thing gives you the chance to sort of, you know, bump into the news you might yeah. be expecting. Um, or bump into a documentary you might have you might have actively searched for it. I think that is a public good. Yeah, I mean, say say in terms of being in the BBC, like Steve, when when you're talking like this, true, and trying trying to suppose the two things: one, find an audience, and two, serve an audience. You know, what kind of role? Like, I mean, are you looking at roles like social media and things like that? And like, are, are, is it a kind of something about like taking this on board and actually doing trying to do something new with it, or trying to do it, uh, trying to do what everyone else is doing? Because often when I come, come across media organisations, it just seems to me that when it comes to things like social media, particularly, it's just there, it's kind of me too. We're doing this because everyone else is doing. It. It's, what, it's, it's what the hip kids are doing right now, so we should be doing it as well. Yeah, I think you need to avoid that temptation about it's, it's, it's in vogue and we need to catch up with it too. There's a great episode of Mad Men where at one point they go, we need some young people. And they hired two young people who talk complete <laughs> nonsense. But they're young and that's what the vogue was at the time. So, uh, but as I say, social media integrates perfectly into, into loads of broadcasting. It integrates perfectly into radio. It integrates perfectly into those types of shows which by their nature are asking for kind of audience calls and responses, current affairs for example, um, discussion shows. Um, do you it, think it's do horses you for courses, there's never, and each platform is slightly different. I think it's interesting looking at our sport portfolio, is that individual, let me get this right, um, Sport NI Twitter feed is more popular than the Facebook piece because Twitter's about facts, information, latest, so you follow that. But you know, the Facebook pages for the individual codes are more popular which makes sense. If you're a rugby fan, you probably want to be in amongst other rugby fans on Facebook, which is mm. more of a community. Um, so it's even within social media platforms, not just two, there's differences even within one genre. Mm. That's why it's complicated. Right. I had a, I had a question, Jeremiah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. basically, when you said about, about like, you know, sometimes it's horses for courses, you talk about current affairs, you know, do you, do you think, you know, like, I mean, current affairs taking kind of, I suppose, cognizance of social media is a good thing? Uh, well, how do you mean? I mean, I mean, like you know, it, it's interesting. Kind of like, I mean, every kind of current affairs show now reaches out to kind of audience and asks them to tweet in or whatever. And there's, yeah. there's times I kind of wonder, like, I mean, the, the like you know, I, I know in popular culture, street teams exist to promote and pimp out kind of brands or whatever. And sometimes I, I look at kind of like the streams, yeah. the streams that kind of current affairs shows are getting, and I'm just seeing kind of like just you can see the kind of street teams behind it in a way, you yeah. know. Yeah, you're wonder, right. I mean, it, it can be overused, and as you say, it's a sort of almost self-selecting. Population. I just mean there are certain sort of TV genres where you know the grammar is well. What do you think? And it's an opportunity to do it. I mean, again, go back to Swap Shop. People used to ring in. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's just a different pl way to do that. It's not necessarily, as you say, reinventing the wheel. Yeah. Final question, Stephen. Thank you very much for your time. Final question. Like, you, what areas do you think BBC Northern Ireland will be covering in the future? I mean, like, you know, do you have a clear idea of what the next five years will be? You mentioned there earlier on, but like, I mean, troubling, uh, co covering, covering the troubles and kind of the aftermath of the troubles. I mean, mm. are there plans to kind of like com have certain anniversary programming around that as well? Well, we're, we're discuss I mean, I think covering the troubles and explaining what happened, as you say, for a generation born who don't know, but also those of us who lived through it, kind of going, what actually happened there? We are looking at that. That, that, that is part of our brief. Whether we peg it to anniversaries or not is actually a, is a discussion we were having the other week. Um, um, I think, I mean, BBC Northern Ireland will be the, the full range of genre. I think that's very important. I think, uh, personally speaking, when I took the job, I had a look at kind of what I think strengths are in Northern Ireland. I think talking and laughing. Um, are two things. So talking, I think, breaks down into 
popular journalism, there's a good documentary tradition here, both in-house and with indies. Speech radio, Radio Ulster is off the charts compared to other BBC local radio stations. So I think talking we're strong at. I think laughing, is, there's, a, there's a northern sense of humour. I think you know, that's something we can be doing. Um, I think it's important that we do that. I think Radio Ulster has some, is a very good way to develop mm. new comedy. It's harder on TV, it's more complicated and expensive. And I think, again, we need to be looking at how to get that onto the network so other people can see that part of our identity. And, you know, the Northern Irish Irish identity, we know in, for Mrs. Brown's Boys, which I was, again, involved in an RTE, that, you know, they, they, there is an appetite for that. We just got to find the right way to do it. You know? mm. I like that. I like that. That's a good way to end it. That's a good slogan for BBC Northern Ireland, talking and laughing. Thank you very Thanks much. So. Thank you.